Mr. Mehta, let me begin by saying welcome to India. What does it feel like to be coming home to this incredible reception with the Israel Philharmonic? Well, you know, this excitement within me has started such a long time ago. It almost started the minute I saw the Indian ambassador in Jerusalem presenting his credentials to the President of Israel. I was the only one present because nobody is allowed at those functions. And as, as soon as that happened, I knew now I will go to India with the orchestra. Why did I know now? Because I've been dreaming about that since the last 25 years, since I became music director. I have been music director of this orchestra since 1969. You have an old and long association with this orchestra and with Israel. How did it begin? It began by chance in 1961. I was really uh, without a job in Israel, in, uh, in Vienna, I'm sorry. And waiting from one stray engagement to another. And suddenly I get this call uh, a telegram from an orchestra whose telegraphic address, in those days we had telegraphic addresses. It's a term forgotten today. And I didn't know which orchestra it was. So I called the Israeli uh, consulate in Vienna. I said, what is this orchestra? Said, what do you mean? This is the Israel Philharmonic. Uh, and they wanted me to reply immediately if I could jump in for a conductor, very famous conductor, Eugene Ormandy, that was sick and had cancelled. So of course I said yes. Um, we corresponded, I made the program up with them. And it was really a love at first sight. Something functioned between us and I was nowhere the experienced conductor that I think I am today. I was really, I mean, the, con the program I did in those days in Israel, I did for the first time. I had never conducted it before. But then in those days, every con uh, concert I did, the program was for the first time. I was so eager to conduct everything I knew that I didn't repeat programs. And 1961 was quite an important year in the fact that I conducted the Israel Philharmonic for the first time, the Vienna Philharmonic, Berlin Philharmonic, and Los Angeles. Uh, Israel and Los Angeles you know, gave me the jobs eventually. And Berlin and Vienna, I've never stopped conducting. Um, you know, I've never left out a year. Oh, you know, the Israel may be an orchestra that you've been associated with for the longest, but the great orchestras that you've conducted are thought of as being the New York and the Los Angeles. How does this orchestra compare with those? Oh, absolutely on a par. Maybe not in 1961. But today? Today, absolutely. I mean, there has been a great building in this orchestra. I have myself engaged, I would say, 95 players through the years. Do you then consider this yours in a way in which emotionally perhaps and in terms of its development the LA and the New York perhaps never became yours although you were with them for a long time? Well no, I, I would say that about Los Angeles also. New York Philharmonic was already a very great orchestra when I started. It didn't need that kind of building. Los Angeles needed building and Israel needed building and uh, I think with both orchestras that I mean that was successful. And the important part in the Israel Philharmonic is the influx of the Russian Jews that have come in since the 1970s. There have been two great Russian uh, immigrations, the early 70s and in the late 80s, early 90s. And both these immigrations uh, fed us with a lot of talent that we could absorb. Without this talent, especially in the string sections, we would be uh, behooved to take foreigners. You know, you're talking about talent. You have brought someone to India who I can only describe as a genius, <coughs> Itzhak Perlman. And it was quite evident seeing the two of you together that you have an incredible rapport. How long have you been playing together? Since about 1967. So that's 25 years. He played with me also, substituting for a, a sick, another genius, Nathan Milstein, in Montreal. He came in, and uh, we've been playing ever since. And since he's Israeli, he's very connected 
emotionally to this orchestra. It is his orchestra. And usually when we go on these momentous concert tours, like China, India this year, like Poland in 1987, like Russia in 1990, I mean, Russia was still Soviet mm -hmm. Union, he has always been with us. first time we play in Cairo, he'll be there. Too. When will that be? We don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's strange. Israel and uh, Egypt have a diplomatic relations since, since 1978, and we still haven't gone. But That's talking how. about concerts for peace, that will be a concert for peace, won't it? The Israel Philharmonic in Cairo. Hmm. It could be even that we will play in Amman before Cairo. Uh, there's something... That's politics for you. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere else in the world, it's like Perlman would have been lionized. In India, because of the enormous popularity of the conductor, he's almost faded away. Has that upset oh, him? No, no, not faded away at all. He had an enormous success yesterday. Yes. Great success. But of course, India, till recently, I don't think is a record-buying public. I don't think you have these huge record stores with classical music uh, departments that are that big, uh, as in... Uh, and the Western countries. So the name is not a household name, is it? No, not yet. There's but something else, too. Itzhak Perlman was a great success yesterday in Delhi, as you said, but the audience weren't quite sure when to clap, and they clapped in the middle of a movement. Did that worry him? No, they clapped at the end of the movement. That uh, doesn't matter. That happened in China, too. <laughs> that, that really, if it happens after very intimate music finishes, and the public claps because they think they have to because there's no more music, then it disturbs. But if it claps out of enthusiasm, like after the first part of the Tchaikovsky concerto, that's all. You've been seeing India, and in a sense, you've been part of India's Western music development. Do you find that appreciation and understanding is growing over the years for the sort of music you play? I can't judge that, because when I come, I feel there's a great amount of appreciation. I don't know what happens <laughs> between my visits. Besides, India has its own music. It's I've always maintained that. When we, you see, we go to Japan every two or three years. And we've just come from Japan also. Every, we play 10 concerts, 10 are sold out, 10 are very enthusiastic. We play four different programs. Uh, I mean, after the concert, talking of record sales, I sit sometimes for half an hour to 45 minutes, not only autographing, but autographing records. So you can imagine the amount of sales that go on uh, there. The Japanese have embraced Western culture and Western music to such a degree that they know much more about Beethoven today than about their own classical music. That's not the case in India. For millions of people, not just in India, but the world over, the name Zubin Mehta is also a name identified with those tremendous concerts held on the eve of the Football World Cup when you conduct <laughs> the three great tenors. What are those occasions like to conduct on? But that those concerts are like opening a bottle of champagne. You know, it just all uh, explodes uh, immediately. Uh, you, you, you know, you give your downbeat. Uh, the, the three the singers uh, are of such great talent, of such beautiful voices, and all three are very close friends. So... Okay, describe to me something. What is the magic that takes place when someone like Zubin Mehta conducts someone like Luciano Pavarotti singing something like O Sole Mio. What happens? You know what? Basically, we are having fun. What happens is that happens in the public. We are having fun on stage. I, uh, you know, and especially that kind of a extremely popular Neapolitan song. 
uh, and having fun, but uh, singing and playing our hearts out. And it's one has to, yeah, one can't be snobby about that uh, at that point. One said, this is the music, even though it's been played, I mean, backwards and forwards for the last 60, 70 years, this is a piece that every Italian and every music lover knows in the world. And we've got to, you know, get to really the, to the core of even that song. And, uh, well, also, you know, this, this uh, aria called Nessun Dorma, which is from the opera Turandot. Now, Turandot is not probably one of the most popular operas of Puccini, not like Bohème or Tosca. But this aria suddenly has become so popular because he sang it. It went the, to the one yeah. at the top of the charts in Britain, didn't it? Yeah, but this record now of the last concert has already sold about four million copies. If there's a criticism that's ever been made of Zubin Mehta, it's that, and this is almost a criticism you ought to like, is that you aren't at this moment in time laying claim to a definitive Zubin Mehta rendition of the Beethoven symphonies or the Mozart symphonies. You haven't left your stamp on a great piece of music, they say. Do you accept that? I don't know who says that. Um, every time we play, I mean, the minute we come on stage, we are laying our stamp on something. Uh, every bar of music that I play or a colleague conducts uh, lays its stamp. Either you agree or you don't agree. And sometimes people don't agree. I suppose the point they're trying to make is that you were a genius when you exploded upon the stage in 1958 after the Liverpool concert. And that perhaps you haven't fulfilled the potential you held out by creating records that will be remembered in a sense long after Zubin mm. stopped conducting? Well, they haven't looked at my royalty statements. <laughs> 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 I think my records sell very well. Um, like with everybody, some records sell extremely well, some not as well. Um, as I said, I just came back from Japan. I've had people bringing me records to autograph that I did in the early uh, 70s. They treasure and keep them up. Yes. I mean, I was surprised. There are some records that I signed that I had forgotten I even had made. Um, so exactly what you are saying didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Let me ask you something else. You aren't any longer connected full time with a big orchestra. Except the Israel Philharmonic. But there, you're a music director for life. But it's not, it's not like your association with the LA or the New York used to be. Well, I'm even more proud of this orchestra. This orchestra today is one of the six, seven best orchestras in the world. We travel more than with any other orchestra that I've been associated with. We travel almost two months a year. But are you not missing out on another big orchestra like the NBA? No, no, no. I was music director in America for 30 years. You're tired. I don't want any more these kind of music directorships. I do much more opera in Europe. But when I travel with the Israel Philharmonic, as the only great cultural organization of that country, we command higher fees than I did with my American colleagues, who were only one of the so several Zubin, American orchestras. So see. Zubin's a richer man today, even though the critics saying he's taking a sabbatical than he was when the critics said he was working full time. Oh, no, I'm working much more today. <laughs> um, Earning more, too? I can't tell. You've lost count. No, I don't know. I don't know because our earnings depend on that year's particular record sales, too. So that goes up and down. Mm. But, but my, my activity in Israel, of course, hardly brings me any income compared to uh, what the American office is. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not in Israel to earn money. So that I get in Israel, for a series of 15 concerts, what I get in Europe for one concert. That's the ratio, really.
This is also a homecoming for you. What's it like being back in Bombay as Apro Zubin? Well, I think I've said this before, probably even on your other interview, but uh, I feel at home in Los Angeles, where I live, on this officially permanent basis, where I'm about two months a year. But then I feel at home in Vienna, where I grew up, musically speaking. I feel very at home in Tel Aviv, where I spent about three months a year. And I feel very at home in Florence, a city that I've got to love since the last 10 years a lot. So that my peripatetic existence takes me to these towns continuously. Then a little bit in London or Berlin, of course. But it's when I put my foot into Bombay and when I ride through the streets of Bombay that in the end I really am home. I just, I just love every brick on the wall. I cry as to what happened to Bombay, as the suffocation of Bombay, as the deterioration of many parts of the aesthetic Bombay I used to love. But I still love Bombay. That's my, uh, <coughs> it's my hometown. And I can't get away from that. Okay, tell me about Hindi. थोड़ा सा हिंदुस्तानी बात करता हूँ बम्बई बम्बई वाले हिंदुस्तानी <laughs> इतने सालों के बाद आप भूले नहीं नहीं क्योंकि मैं बाहरगाम में भी जब भी अपॉर्चुनिटी मिलती है तो मैं बोलता है <laughs> सब मिस्टेक के साथ गुजराती आई स्पीक कंटिन्यूसली विद माई पेरेंट्स Gujarati, I speak really very fluently and there's no problem. I read But I speak also the Parsi Gujarati. And the Parsi Gujarati is a dialect which has never been defined as such, but it is. And it's a dialect, unfortunately, that's dying out because the next generation is hardly speaking it. The Parsi is abroad. My generation, Parsi is abroad, speak it. Their children speak German, uh, Canadian, American, English. Uh, Unfortunately, so Gujarati as a language is spoken by 30 or 40 million people. That's perfectly intact. But the Parsi dialect is uh, unfortunately on its way out. And I'm sorry about that. I, I read somewhere that you're very conscious of trying to preserve not just the Parsi dialect, but the Parsi culture. It means a lot to you, doesn't it? Well, I don't know what Parsi culture is. Parsi cooking surely <laughs> is part of it. You look as if you enjoy it very much. Uh, yes, I enjoy it. But I enjoy Indian food tremendously. I was recently given an incredible, real Punjabi dinner in Delhi. My friends, uh, I enjoyed every, every morsel of it. <laughs> Do you get to eat a lot of Indian food abroad, or is it yes. only occasionally? Yes. In fact, one of the great Indian restaurants of the world is in Tel Aviv. Really? Run by a Punjabi gentleman, uh, Vinod Pushkarna is his name. He and his sort of half-Jewish wife have settled in Israel. And it is the most popular restaurant in Tel Aviv today. Incredible. So uh, I eat my, my, my heart out there. <laughs> <laughs> I gather that you're also, at least on paper, planning to return to India in 1997, this time with the London Symphony. Is that right? Well, we're talking about it. Nothing, really nothing has been finalized. But if you come, will you go all over? Because a lot of people in Calcutta and Madras are rather upset you haven't gone there this time. Yes, I'm not upset, but uh, I'm disappointed that I couldn't go to those places either. But it had to do with my schedule and the orchestra schedule too. That it just was this much time. Because the Israeli government was very anxious, not only that we come to India, but also to China. So instead of two weeks in India, we could only do one week and one week in so China. So if you come in 97, will you go to places like uh, Pune, Goa, perhaps Bangalore, Hyderabad? Well, uh, there was a tour that was um, scheduled two years ago with the London Philharmonic which had all these places, uh, Bangalore, Goa, Pune, on the list. And that was cancelled because of lack of funds from the English side. Uh, but you might revive it now. Yeah, it depends on how much time uh, every tour allows. Uh, everything has to do in the end with economics. <laughs> Sad, isn't it? Especially with the arts, yeah. There are millions talking about the arts. There are millions who will have heard you last night. 
and who will hear you in the next three, four nights right up to this week. Loved the performance, but uncertain how to react to the music. What advice would you give them so that their appreciation Well, first of all, to listen more. If something, if a particular piece has gotten to you, now we played yesterday uh, three major works of the classical repertoire as the concert program, and then three encores of a sort of a romantic nature. Uh, if any one of these pieces has really spoken to you, well then listen to it more and more and more, and this is the way, even without having knowledge of what you're listening to, it will speak to you. Just similarly, as a Western person who listens to Ravi Shankar and is absolutely enveloped by this art, Let and he goes and buys his racket and he listens to more. This is the first step. Just feed it to yourself. Uh, and, and see what it does to you. And then if you're curious, read about it. There's lots to read about. There's no problem getting a book on classical music. Uh, even on the record, you'll have your superficial analysis of it. Okay, one final question. A little bird tells me that when your concert tour is over, you're going to be taking a little private holiday in India. Is that right? Uh, no, I had two days off, and I'm not taking that holiday. I'm going straight home because I need really to be at home for two days without doing anything. I have a very important concert coming up in Vienna for the New Year's uh, Day. Uh, uh, every New Year's Day, the Vienna Philharmonic plays a program devoted to the Strauss family, the Johann Strauss family. And this year, I've been given this honor to conduct. And I have to work on that program a lot. And that's my priority as soon as the Bombay programs are over. Well, I wish we could hear that, but sadly, we can't. Well, it's televised all over the world. Depends on Doordarshan. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope they're hearing you. Mr. Mehta, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thank you.